Okay, so Jawaria, you just asked, how does my kind of energy network analysis fit with planetary health? And the, yeah. simple, the explanation goes something like this. All right, the root problem of all of our problems, not economic, you know, environmental, social, you know, all of it is in fact this oligarchic capitalism, all right? And the solution, if you're gonna have long-term sustainability, you have to attack that root problem as well. And you have to have a way, you have to have an understanding of what you have to do in order to build something that doesn't have the same problems, doesn't just steer us back into the same kind of recurrent crises that we do, whether it's economic or financial or pandemics or, or environmental, or it, it's all part of the same kind of maximizing the profit for a few people, regardless of the impact on other people and the planet as a whole. All right. So what the energy network stuff does is it basically gives you a very logical and common sense as well as a rigorous and heartwarming, it's my, my favorite part is it is actually heartwarming, approach to understanding what we need to do as a civilization, as a global civilization and at every level to build back in a way that doesn't re repeat the oligarchic problems that we're currently facing. And the charm of it all is that it does, it basically says we're a collaborative learning species and that in order to, to be an effective collaborative learning species, we have to have a common cause culture, which a lot of people have written about and studied in terms of, uh, my, one of my favorites is Eleanor Ostrom who won the Nobel Prize, or, but there's Wangari Mathai. There's all sorts of people who are working at what really goes into creating a common cause culture. And it's not just love is all you need. It basically, a lot of it has to do with reciprocity and accountability and information flow and accuracy and and this balance between flexibility and constraint which is essential i mean and the, all of these things are mirrored in in the way energy systems work so um when it comes to how does it apply to planetary health per se it says first we need to look at the underlying root cause which is how do we go about building healthy human networks and what does that mean and what you know how do we measure it what are the key elements that go into it and that to the extent that it's not we're not, you know in terms of the environmental side of things it's not that we're going to find one final solution to how, how we make the planet healthier it's going to be an ongoing learning process and each time we come up with a new solution it will try it for a while and there'll probably be some kind of shortfalls and then we'll have to rethink. And so it's a very much of an iterative process that you go through. But what you have is this overlying understanding of that nature as a whole ends up producing these particular patterns that, that you, you have to mirror if you're going to have long-term sustainability. The obvious one of that is this fractal distribution of small, medium and large because that uh, maximizes circulation from top to bottom. So in economic terms, you need to have this ability to, for the, the little guys to be able to spend money so that they can purchase the products so that the suppliers can make them and hire more people. And so that's how you get this nice circulation going. And I mean, this is classic economics. This is not something new. It's just that we have a, a more comprehensive and logical and measurable way of explaining why this you need to have this particular balance of small, medium and large. And particularly why excessive concentration is, in fact, it undermines the health of the whole society and the whole economy, in, you know, including the people who are incredibly rich. On the other mm -hmm. hand, it also says that it's not that we want to get rid of all rich people and that everybody's going to be exactly the same. No, no, no. You need people who actually or you need a level of the system that has high concentration and is highly efficient so that they can do the, you know, the large scale cross scale things efficiently, which is why efficiency is important. But if you have too much of that, what it'll do is it'll suck all the wealth up from the bottom and, and create economic necrosis, which is what we're partially facing today. So that Amazon is making money hand over fist, but it's also driving out of business all the local people who may have well, who need to 
have they, they represent the diversity and the resilience that the system needs so that if there's some kind of problem or if Amazon gets too concentrated, <coughs> you have a way to um, spring back or find alternatives, which are so hopefully developing through this diverse, intricate, lower, lower level systems that we really need to have in, in balance with the bigger ones. So the, but now there's a mathematical ratio called power laws that say exactly what the ratio of the small, medium, and large needs to be. So you now need, you now have an exact way of measuring all of that. So from one perspective, we're thinking of how to measure the complexity of human systems so that we find this balance between the natural world and our own role, right? Another question that we, we need to find is how to make businesses behave more sustainably, right? So you're talking about CEOs helping the circulation and flow of money in the economy so that we're helping everyone, right? right? It's, it's very much a cultural change issue in that kind of sense, yes. And right, leadership so let's bring, turns, turns yeah. out to be central, right? Yeah, so let's bring in Sue Wen in this point. Sue okay. Wen, how can <laughs> businesses act more sustainably? How can I think uh, one of the things we can do is to mobilize the money we have, the mo mobilize the money we have in the financial market or the asset under management, because it's estimated that, for example, three trillion dollars a year is needed to tackle the United Nations 17 sustainable development goals, such as climate change, poverty, hunger. People may think that, well, $3 trillion per year is a lot, but it's actually not. The total asset under management globally is over $100 trillion. So even if only 3% of that money goes into impact investing or social investment, whichever we are describing, because we have so many terms now, like ESG as well, we can solve these grand challenges we are facing. And uh, I think uh, Sally is probably an economist. So when we are talking about the father of econo economics, we think about Adam Smith. And also we are based in Scotland. So people are probably more familiar with his masterpiece, the, uh, the Wealth of Nations, where he talked about markets and also the, the other things, uh, the, the invisible hand. While Adam Smith is, took more pride in another book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. So I think in the, moral, uh, the Theory of Moral Sentiments, it's about the visible heart, where he actually talked about the compassion, the uh, altruism, and social impact. He, I, when I was reading his book, I was surprised to see that he actually said, human beings are not only want to be lovely, but also want to be loved. And I was surprised to see here talking about this uh, altruism thing. So I actually think Adam Smith is the advocate for impact investing or social investment, or the business with business can do good and do well at the same time. Yeah. So, right. But of course, then, I mean, I, I love that you brought up the theory of moral sentiments. I think that, I mean, it's so important. And so people, few people realize that. I mean, the actual, what they've done is the, the, the oligarchic part of the civilization has taken this part where um, self-interest, which is a very small part of that whole thing, and blown it completely out of proportion. Exactly. It's fragmented. So the, the heart of economics or the business is why. So why we are having a business? We're having a business to do good and the byproduct is to do money. I think there is a chocolate bakery in New York. They were saying, we are, we are not hiring people to make chocolates, but we are making chocolates to hire people. So if we think about the ends and means, and sometimes we, we overemphasize the profit, the importance of profit, but that's only a vehicle, not to the end. So right. the end purpose of every business, I think, is to do good and to create a uh, well, the society full of well-being and yeah, and healthy, happy people. And all you, but unfortunately, what you need to do nowadays is have an economic theory that justifies that, because yeah. we don't have that. I mean, right now, we still have maximizing profit for owners alone, and as a result, and what you do is you end up maximizing the profit for owners and minimizing the well-being of every, everybody and everything else. So, uh, and again, Amazon is a good example of this. I mean, they're making money hand over fist, but they're also 
minimizing the amount that they distribute to their workers so that they're, they're, you know, they're under, they're tr they, their workers are trying to unionize in order to get a $15 an hour wage and Amazon is doing all sorts of dirty tricks in order to avoid that. Yes, so yes. I'm, in classical I, economic theory, in you, the reason you give tax breaks to the rich is so that they will invest it back in their companies. And the, and the reason the companies will be able to sell stuff is because they're, they're paying their uh, employees enough to, to buy things that they, that, that they are producing. I mean, that's the classic Henry Ford idea. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not what's happening nowadays. And so part of the problem is, is this leadership business is, it's how do you get people who've been trained that, well, and it's not only that they've been trained, but they're the whole, the incentive system and your well-being, your ability to, to pr make money and, and progress in your job are all dependent upon fitting into this existing maximize the wealth of, of, of a few people kind of idea. Yeah, yeah, I agree about the, especially the idea about incentives. I think let's continue with the Amazon example. They treat their employees badly, for example. And right. nowadays, I think millennials, they are paying when they are looking for jobs, their surveys and the statistics show they are not lo looking for money. They want to join more socially responsible business. Right. They want to do good. And also they want to have a better uh, envir a working environment. So Amazon, by treating their employees badly, is paying a reputation task, uh, task if there is an, anyone, anything like that. Task. So the more the future generations may not want to work for them, so they may need to pay a premium to attract more talents, while the other more socially responsible business, they may find it easier to get talents and sustain their business. On the other, I agree completely. And th this sort of brings up the whole issue of education. No. Um, and not only how much education you, is ex available to you, but what kind. So I did some work with some um, educational reform people. And from their point of view, the uh, educational in here in the US, they call it public education. It's the general education for the public at large, as opposed to what it is in, in Scotland and in, in the UK. But um, so everyday schools are built on, a, on the Prussian plan, which was developed in 1819 and was designed to create uh, people who were obedient workers, who always knew their place in the pecking order because there was always somebody who was ranked higher than they were, who knew how to read and write and follow instructions, but were largely insecure so that they didn't want to go out and start their own business or you know, compete or those kinds of things. And that's as opposed to what they know how the way human brain works, which is that you need to have meaning making, you need to have um, cooperative or synergetic kinds of uh, learning so that different types of people join their, their complementary skills so that you, and you have a, a kind of a synergetic or, and you need to have sufficient diversity of talents and yeah. skills really in order to get the whole thing to work. Um, and so, the, and they've known how to make these kind. They know how to make education and learning fun and and exciting and 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 relevant and meaningful and problem solving and experiential and all the kinds of things that you need. And when you do that, you create lifelong learners. And it doesn't matter what they go into, whether they're going into construction or science or finance or whatever it is they have this general sense of, of, I need to link up with others in order mm -hmm. to have meaningful work that's making a positive contribution to my society. And when I do that, I will make enough money, but mostly I will feel good about what I do with my life. And that's the goal of the kind of education we need, but that's not what we currently have. And I've seen, places where they've in, in, implemented this kind of learning and it's just mind boggling, it's transformative and it spreads. I mean, so I went to one in Arizona which was in a, a rel relatively poor neighborhood. And what happens is that, you know, the kids go to school and they're coming back and they're very excited and they're doing these rules of collaborative learning. And then they talk to their parents and they intervene in kind of like domestic abuse problems and the parents, get excited because oh my goodness you know my kid is now asking me to not beat up on its, his mother or and then they they come and they join the school and they 
they participate in 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 helping out landscaping and they and they participate in in teaching kids or taking them on field trips or showing them what they do for the, for their to earn their own living so it's it's really astounding what difference it makes, but in order to have the kind of people who can push back on the oligarchy, you need to have that kind of education and have it available to everybody. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's to cultivate people to take a holistic view when they are small, not just to pursue something single-minded, but to think about other things and have a balanced life right. as well. Yeah. So, you, do you actually work with uh, people who in in um, pardon me I'm sorry I'm blanking on the name uh, impact investing. impact investing yes thank you uh, I uh, apart from my uh, PhD study I'm I'm also working for some uh, and business angel investors in Scotland oh. so so I, I really it's interesting to see how I've been working for them for since end of 2018 so over two years now it's good to see how the angel investment community community is changing and they are really looking into more social investment and more investment with impact and green investment so I'm, I'm really happy to to see that people are the paradigm is shifting from risk and return to risk and return and impact yeah so do you see, I mean, you mentioned social investments as well as the environmental ones. And yeah. is that, is there much money going into the social parts? And if so, what kinds of things are attracting money? Um, that's a, that's a good, good question. So uh, because the, the Android investors I'm working with are more into the energy sector. So that's more like the green, more environmental invest. But still, I'm not sure if you know first support which is an incubator in Edinburgh, and they hmm. would incubate some social enterprises in Scotland. Because Scotland, it, although it's a small country, there are over 6,000 social enterprises, surprisingly, with 5 million people. So that's, that's really a huge, a huge amount of social enterprises. Yeah, so in terms of the money goes into like bakery and also some... Uh, like the online good food club, like the online delivery, or brew dog, brew, brew, brew gooder. You probably know the beer, the brew thing. Yeah. So it's a there are a variety of social enterprises. Yeah. And also there are some social media agencies recruit uh, disabled people to do website design. So it's uh, to achieve multiple social benefits. So, what makes something a social enterprise as opposed to a classical enterprise? So, uh, so, well, the definition of social enterprise, depending where you are. So in Scotland context, social enterprise is a hybrid between a charity and a commercial, a traditional for-profit business. And if, to be able to be a social enterprise in Scotland, you have to have this asset lock. So the asset, of, for example, the profit made from the social enterprise has to be locked into the social enterprise so you cannot sell it. There you go. Or act it to a commercial business and make it some a trick because if there is a yeah people may want to look for some tricks but you cannot do that so the asset is locked and even if you want to sell that business it you have to sell it to another social enterprise or business with a similar kind. Yeah. Oh that's so, wonderful. Actually they have a I mean they have a non-profit definition here but it's sort of been corrupted so mm -hmm. that um you know, originally all of the profits had to stay in, in the business in order to make it a nonprofit. And it had to have some kind of social mission that it was pursuing or some kind of positive, contributive kinds of mission. But, you know, they've gotten around it by saying that, okay, but if you're a CEO of one of these places, you can still make, you know, 500 times as much as your most paid employee. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, that uh, sounds like very self conflictory <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, they just found out a way to get around the good intention. So is there, I like this idea of, of the way you're approaching social uh, enterprise. And okay, so in my world, there is a scale issue. So the bigger you get, the harder it is to maintain that kind of social consciousness and social mission in life. Is there, mm -hmm. does, does having these, the profits locked up in a uh, lockbox help that? 
I, yeah, that's the thing. That's what also what I discovered in my research. This, there is a danger of mission drift if you want to scale. And also sometimes I find that, especially social enterprise in Scotland, some people don't want to scale. They want to maintain this small and nice well, and beautiful thing because yeah. they are serving the community. And if they, you go too big or become a franchise or a chain, you, can, you can't lose the heart-ish. So yeah, there are some people, they, they don't, there are some investors even approach to them saying well, they want to invest, but they, they don't want to take more money. <laughs> they want to, it's more like lifestyle business for, for a lot of social enterprises. Oh yeah, absolutely. And in, in many ways, I think that's a wonderful and great thing for, for it to be. I mean, it, stay small and wholesome is, is kind of like the idea. On the other hand, particularly like in farming and food networks, we find that in order to maintain the quality and the, and the local ownership, you really need to have some kind of common cause network that you build out of it. Um, so a couple of people in, in, my, in this Research Alliance for Regenerative Economics that, group that I have, that's their job. They, they try to put together small local farmers in kind of common cause networks so that they, you know, that you can buy organic seeds um, and have, so with economies of scale, if you have a bunch of people buying them or same thing with distribution networks. So you get some of the advantages, but hopefully they're designed in a way that it keeps the, the ownership locally and you just, and individuals, but you have to have, but you have to kind of conform to a particular set of rules so that it isn't that somebody belongs to this and then just goes off and does horrible, nasty, you know, genetically modified things kind of mm -hmm. thing. So do you have any of that kind of stuff going on there in Scotland? Uh, I'm not sure. Of course, I cannot say for every single single one of them. As far as I know, probably not. I also guess it's also because the scale, again, of Scotland. It's a small country and look, even in Edinburgh, we only have, yeah, five, five, half, a, half a million people. So everyone kind of knows everyone. It's, uh, yeah, you can 30 minutes walk from where I live, you can go to almost anywhere in the city, yeah. What, another problem I find with social enterprise though is the succession. Because for example, who is kind of family business style, who, who would take over once the first generation founder retire? Right. So that's one thing I find maybe need some, yeah. Well, and that's, that's sort of true in all of the, in whether it's a socially responsible business or not. Um, mm -hmm. And they have different types of, I mean, there's a whole bunch of sociology on or business research on types of leaders for different types of different size um, organizations and also different places in their life cycle. They need different kinds of leadership. Yeah. So Juaria, what are you doing there? <laughs> we, we can't I even see you. Your lovely You're still there? <laughs> yes, I am. I'm just fascinated by the whole conversation. I, I think you find this interesting. If, if we're applying this to low middle income countries, how does this idea of social entrepreneurship work there? Sue, and like, how would it work? Are we, because we're thinking of investing in community businesses that serve the community and the locals that they're operating in, whether it's addressing social issues or environmental issues. But if we translate the same model to um, a low middle income country, how would that work? Would it work through microfinance loans? What's the sort of, um, you know, what's the leverage? What's the tool that you would leverage in order to do the same there? I think the important thing to transfer the model because the thing with some local social enterprises is they are very much embedded in the local context. So if you want to transfer the business into another different context, something work here in place A may fail in place B. So the yeah. core, I think, is to find out the core impact unit. That's what I call it because we have CPU for computer. So we have CIU for, for social enterprise, the core impact unit. That's what I say. To find how the impact model actually works. So on the one hand, we have the impact model to see, to know your theory of change. Basically, what's the input, what are the activities and what's the output and then outcome and impact, how the entire chain works. And then once you know how that works, then you can apply the 
philosophy or thing into another context. You may have to change the the clothes of that person, or but the 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 core would be the same. Yeah. So to find the impact model and also the business model. So what? Could you give me an example of what's an impact model? Um, so for example, if we take a local bakery as an as an example, so maybe the input would be the 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 bakery, the the bread, and also the cakes you have made, and then you would bake those. And the output can be some. You can teach people how to do how to bake the cakes online, and you can sell the whole grain, the healthy uh, things to people, so they can uh, improve their health. So the educational content teach them how to do bakeries can be educational and improve their mental health. That model may work in Scotland, but that may not work in some other places. For example, if there is a bad internet connection, you may not be able to deliver that course online. You may have to change into in-person. Or if you are uh, delivering uh, to other people, yeah, so maybe basically the delivery model would change, the logistics would change depending on the local context. Hmm. So operating within the context and finding solutions relevant to the context are important for right. there to be success. Some, yeah, <laughs> yeah in, in my terms, it's all the energy that's available in the context really determines the kinds of models that, is, that are going to work or the kind of, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, which... So when, when it, yeah. Go ahead. So when we're thinking of the problem, we're thinking of co-creating solutions with agents working in the regions that we find, right? So, for instance, if we're thinking of healthcare, one of the bigger issues we face is the spread of non-communicable diseases. But say you have um, industries imported from the first world, fast food chain industries who are sort of propping this, you know, this bad eating habit within low middle income countries and the only food that local community dwellers can afford is buying from these fast food chain networks. How do we think of building, um, how do we address non-communicable diseases when we're dealing with industries like these multinational corporations working in low middle income countries who are obviously um, sort of profiting from the structure and equality that's existing there? How would we be able to then support local businesses to offset that balance, build healthy communities, healthy networks as Dr. Gorner's talking about? Is it's our yeah, businesses, if we sponsor the social entrepreneurs within those communities, is it, can it be effective in doing that to offset that imbalance, that power imbalance, if that makes sense? Hello? Sue Wen, did you hear her? Yeah. Oh, yes, I think I, my screen froze. Uh, oh, froze I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you, uh, Juaria, you are mentioning how, how to tackle the... Yeah, so just thinking of the uh, big tobacco industries or the, you know, the alcohol industry, how they would sort of foster an unhealthy, healthy habits within countries that leads to the rise of non-communicable diseases. How do we support small social entrepreneurs trying to offset the imbalance with those big multinational corporations operating in the same space, if that makes sense? Mm-hmm. I think, well, first of all, I think that's very difficult. And I think that's yeah. a system issue. So we, if we think about social entrepreneurs doing a bottom-up approach to try to do some grassroots innovation and have some local impact, we would also need top-down approach. For example, policy uh, support from the government, especially there are some emerging countries where the the, maybe the, the legal system is not very healthy. We would even need more from the top down to, or even provide subsidies and give tax break. So we would need those systematic change to support and help those social entrepreneurs to make the change they want. Yeah. Otherwise they're, yeah, as you say, those big multinational companies are very powerful. <laughs> So one of the things that I've been wondering is whether the impact investing kinds of ideas could in fact shape or shift a little bit anyway of the big multinationals and their approach. Is that anything, is that anything you guys work on in impact investing? I, I would think so. For example, if we take fossil and fuel industry as an example, there are more and more 
uh, big asset managers, pension funds are divesting from fossil and fuels. So they are forced by divesting. It's actually like a vote. They are voting no to what they are doing. Even University of Edinburgh, they, they have divested from those fossil fuels. So by supporting more renewable energy, more sustainable energy, they are using their money to show that we are really opposing those fossil fuel companies. And I think we have already seen behavior change in those companies as well. For example, BP, Shell, those big companies, they are actually investing in more renewable energy, green energy, small startups as a venture. I think they have several like venture awards to support those companies. Yeah. So do we think there's any worry about uh, greenwashing kind of will, you know, the big companies will make a show of doing some of these the small scale stuff while still trying to figure out how to maintain their maximizing profit maximizing practices. I, yeah, greenwash, I think it's one handed. Mm, yeah, I've seen some, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, I think it's, it's probably inevitable. I wouldn't say it's inevitable, but I'd say they, they are, they are a, existing in, the, in our current world, un unfortunately. Yeah. But it's interesting. Uh, well, the last place I worked at the Capital Institute, one of the guys uh, that was there slightly before me, a guy named Tim McDonald, was very focused on using the pension funds who manage a huge amount of money to toward, sort of transform or create these kinds of pressure that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about some of that is just educating uh, pension fund managers because right now they think, you know, well, I'm making lots of money in, in the stock market and the fact, yes, it may be unstable, but still, I'm, you know, you hear all this, it's going to be better anyway, so you should stay in there. Um, but there, he was, he was advocating taking um, companies, he used the example of Skippy Peanut Butter, which may, which is one of the largest manufacturers of peanut butter. They have like 60% market share in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And pushing back on them to have organic peanuts and not use, you know, have recycling and all sorts of other kinds of green things, but also in their managerial practices to make sure that it's very much like your social enterprises. They were reinvesting in their companies and reinvesting in their employees and reinvesting in rethinking practices so that they're constantly and, and maintaining a certain level of the managers couldn't earn more than a certain amount so that you couldn't just have people who were essentially extracting the wealth from the away from the thing. Um, and he, it's too bad. It, it didn't really get off the ground because he had a, management problem but um but i think it, it makes sort of sense because especially with the pension funds mm -hmm. there is so much yeah there is so much potential for creating pressure or having votes as you would say yeah yeah i definitely and also again it's it's back to you, what you mentioned earlier about education it's also about mm -hmm. education the government because the regulatories they can use regulatory power to ask them to disclose what they have invested yeah and also as consumers we can also have a bigger voice now because of thanks to the social media and everything else two years ago there is a guy in australia sued his pension fund manager saying, you are investing in the things that is harmful <laughs> to our climate. Yes. <laughs> so I think I, I cannot remember the result. He probably won the, the case. That's, that's two years ago. Yeah, I should probably look up. But that's how powerful uh, even an individual can, can make. So if we have more transparency, we can definitely turn the tide. But you also need the alternatives. You need to be able to find a place to invest your money that is you know, that has some kind of decent return, but on the other hand, is, is more socially responsible and, and environmentally responsible and sustainable yeah. in that kind of a sense. <coughs> okay, great. I think we can wrap this up quite nicely. <laughs> okay, having solved the world's problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, no, I think we've developed and I think understood the importance of um, education, good leadership.